Thank you. Appreciate the opportunity to be here. Glad to see you stayed around. You know, one good thing about having the beer after the last session is more people stay around for the last session anyway. So regardless if you're here for me or for the beer, I appreciate you being here. I appreciate the opportunity to be here. I've been able to make some, renew some old acquaintances from people that I've seen on my previous trips to uh, Idaho, and I've met some new people, and I've been very impressed with the program up to now. One of the things I've really been impressed with during the day and still now is the, the number of young people in the audience. You know, everybody's young relative to me almost, but anyway, there's been a lot of young people here. You know, what, what we're involved in here is a movement. It's a major kind of social, eventually will be a political movement. And up to a, a certain point, you know, I've been involved in this for like 25 years now in the sustainability. I'll tell a little bit more about that later. But, but there was a point in time whenever there was a great deal of concern within the sustainable agriculture movement because there was getting to be just a, a lot of gray heads in the audience. It was a lot of people that had started back in the 60s and 70s, as I mentioned, with the, the early organic movement, and they were getting older and getting tighter, and there were fewer young people coming into the, into the movement. But more recently, I would say over the last five to seven years, that's changed. The big conferences all across the country are more and more young people are coming in. Almost all of them now will have a, a young people section, sometimes a pre-conference that has to do with the young people. There's, there's young farmers organizations that are starting like the Greenhorns out in the West and others around the country. There's a, just an increasing number of young people, young, bright, articulate, thoughtful people that are saying, I want to be a farmer. I don't want to get out of college and go out here and, and get locked into a big house payment and a big car payment and have kids and a bunch of debt and get locked into working 60 hours a week for some big corporation somewhere and not have time to spend the money that I'm making. I'm, I want to I live a life that I can feel good about. And so when I look out across the audiences now, when I have an opportunity to go to the conferences, not just a, a, a conference where you see a lot of graying, you're seeing a lot of more texting and tweeting these days than you're seeing grading, and I think that's a, a good sign. You know, we always talk about young people, and we say the young people are the future, and they always are, but the challenges and opportunities of young people today, I think, are far greater than they've been in my lifetime. Because even though you have great challenges, you have an opportunity to create a fundamentally better future than anything any of us in this room have ever known. The, the title of my presentation that we agreed on after going back and forth a few times was that I would talk about a, an economic perspective on sustainable agriculture, past, present, and future. So I've kind of hinted at that. I want to begin by saying that, that I believe that we are within the midst of an agricultural revolution. I think we're in the midst of a great transition within our society as a whole, but agriculture is a big part of that, and I'll focus on agriculture as a part of that today. I think the, the transition in agriculture that we're going through today is at least as big as when we replaced horsepower with tractor power as in my early childhood. And I think it quite possibly would be as, as big as when we removed land from the commons and began to take individual ownership and was the first of the, the family farms. I think that, that people that are my age at the end of this century, that that's what the so-called modern industrial agriculture of today will, will be, have no more relevance to their lives than the horse and buggy days in the cities has to ours. That's how big the change I think that we're, that we're, that we're going through. Now, my perspective on this transition, my perspective on sustainable agriculture is an economic perspective, but it's different than the, the perspective of many agricultural economists that are particularly my age and, and even younger. It's the perspective of an economist that spent the, the past 25 years plus years 
looking at the sustainability of agriculture, economic sustainability in general, but the sustainability of agriculture. Many other economists have not been occupying their time by looking at the same kind of things. And so my perspective is much different than you would get from many other economists. And, and one of the things that I've learned over the years is, is that, that your perspective comes from what you see or what you find, and what you find is determined by a great extent by what you're willing to look for. And so my perspective is my own, but it's as much a reflection of, of what I've looked for as it is what I've found. And so when I'm talking about the past, present, and future, it's, it's what I've found. It's what I frequently refer to as, as, as my truth. It's what I believe to be true. Now, you know, our, our truth is different. I, I think reality exists as potentials, and we each have a different perspectives. We have an each a different perspective on reality or a perspective on truth or a, a different potential that we see of the same reality. And I don't think any of us should be so arrogant as to think that only we see the reality. We see it from our particular perspective. So if your perspective, your truth is different from mine, then that's to, to be expected. And I have respect for yours if it's different from mine, as, as long as you're actually looking for the truth, which I am, rather than trying to hide from it. I, I speak my truth with conviction because I know why I believe what I believe. And all I ask is that you know why you believe what you believe. And in my opinion, just because some so-called expert said it or you read it somewhere is not a very good reason to believe much of anything. You know, when we approach truth from that perspective, then it says it's not so much a matter of who's right and who's wrong. We may both be right even though we see the world differently. The big question is which perspective can best guide us toward the future that will make our lives and the lives of human life on Earth fundamentally better? That's what I'm looking for. Now, if you're gonna understand my truth, then you need to understand a little bit about my story. We all have stories. I grew up on a small dairy farm down in southwest Missouri. My brother Don is still on that farm and he was still milking cows till he retired a few years ago at 65 years old. He still has cattle on the farm, but he's just not milking cows there anymore. And it was still a small farm. He's still milking less than 50 cows. But he, he had spent his whole life there. He had a good life there. He raised his kids, sent his kids to college. Wasn't wealthy, but had a good life. Some people have said to me, I've been accused of leaving the farm because it was too much work and too little pay. I left the farm because there were five kids. And at that time, the farm would only start, support one family. And my dad said, whoever really wants to farm, and my, little, my, small brother, or my younger brother did, he got the farm and the rest of us moved on to do other things and I'm not sorry for that, but that's kind of my upbringing. After I was fortunate enough to go to school at the University of Missouri back in the days when it didn't cost a fortune to go to school, almost anybody could go and work their way through if you're willing to work hard enough. After I got my BS degree, then I went out for a few years. I spent, got, took care of my military obligation and with a six months reserve and six years in the reserve and worked three years with Wilson Packing Company, the fourth largest meat packer in the country at that time. I decided that wasn't what I wanted to do with my life, so I came back to the university and got my master's and PhD degrees in agricultural economics. After I got my PhD, I worked then for 30 years in various academic positions at four different universities, North Carolina State, Oklahoma State, University of Georgia, and University of Missouri. Now, the first half of that 30-year career, I was a very traditional agricultural economist. That's the way I'd been taught, and that's what I was teaching. I would tell farmers, I always had an extension appointment as well as doing research and extension, so I was out here working with farmers and people in rural communities, and I would tell farmers that, that farming as a way of life was a thing of the past and that farming had to be a business if they expected to survive. That they had to farm for the economic bottom line, and if it was a family farm, then they need to separate the family business from the farm business and not let the family get in the way of the farm. 
And if they wanted to stay in agriculture, they, they had to be prepared to get big, sort of the Earl Butts philosophy of get big or get out, because if you can't get big, you can't have economy scale and you're not gonna be competitive in the future. So that's what I was teaching and that's what I was taught. But during the 1980s that I still refer to as the farm financial crisis, I had to rethink all that. I had to rethink what I had been teaching and what I had been taught. Because I could see at, the, at, at that, that time, you know, that what I was, thought I was about wasn't working. See, I, I got all this education that worked so hard because I wanted to make farming a better way of life. I wanted to, to make the kind of farming that, that my brother was doing and my parents had done. I wanted to take a lot of the drudgery out of that kind of farming business and I wanted to put more profit into it. But during the farm financial crisis of the 1980s, then the farmers, kind of like my brother or like I was out here working with, those farmers, many of those farmers were, were, were losing their farms. We hadn't made farming a better way of life. What we had done is replaced the physical drudgery of farming with the financial misery. You see, at, at that particular time during the, the 1970s was very profitable times in agriculture, not all that different from recent years. And, and we were going to feed the world and export markets were expanding and, and commodity prices were booming. And so we were out here telling farmers to, to get big. And many of the farmers that took our advice, they did get big. They expanded, they built, more, they built buildings and they bought more equipment, they bought more land and they borrowed heavily to do it. And that was back in the days of high inflation and high interest rates. But, but the so-called experts, we experts were saying that the, the global economy is going to continue to grow indefinitely and we have to feed the world. What happened, we got into the 1980s, we went into a domestic recession, tried to bring inflation under control. We did, we brought it down. But along with the domestic recession was a global recession that followed on the heels of that and those commodity prices, those farmers were depending upon fell like a rock and they were caught with huge debts at record high interest rates and they simply couldn't repay their loans. And on the evening network news, it was farm foreclosures and bankruptcies and protest sales at almost all across the country. And there was, wasn't uncommon to hear of another farmer considering suicide because they were losing their farms. Now, by that time, I was at the University of Georgia. I was the head of the Extension Agricultural Economics Department at that time. And it was the responsibility of the people in my department to go out and try to help these farmers find some way to save the farm, to survive, or if they couldn't survive, sell the farm while they still had some equity or maybe save their marriage or at least talk them out of killing themselves. And we would sit across the table with these people with their records when they come in. And we realized, I realized it was the so-called good farmers that were in the biggest trouble. It was the farmers that had done what we so-called experts had told them to do, get big. And the farmers that we had labeled kind of as the laggards that had stayed with their kind of diversified, smaller farming operations, they weren't doing all that well, but, but they were still holding on. Their farms were a little bit more sustainable than the others. And, and I began to realize that the so-called good farmers were failing and it wasn't really their fault. Some of them may have been poor managers, but they certainly weren't all poor managers. They were doing what seemed to make sense at that time. I, I couldn't go on doing it. I didn't believe anymore what I'd been taught and what I was been teaching. I had to remove those blinders and look somewhere else for the solutions. I'd been looking at everything in terms of the economic training that I'd had, and I only found what I was looking for, and now I was seeing things that didn't fit. I had to remove those blinders and try to find new truth if my life was gonna be worth living in my profession. I was going to continue doing what I was doing. I could see then, if I began to remove those blinders, that, that it wasn't just the farm families that were failing. It was the rural communities that depended upon those families, those farming communities that depended on the families out there. You, you know, those communities were suffering as well. Sure, we were still producing commodities, but, but folks, it doesn't just take agricultural production to support farming communities, it takes people. It takes families. 
takes families, not just people, to, uh, farmers, to buy agricultural supplies, but it takes families to shop on Main Street and to buy the clothes and the cars and the, and the haircuts and the various other things that keep that open. But even more important, it takes families to have children to go to school so you can keep the, the school over and, and, and families to be in the church pews and families to form the uh, volunteer fire departments and provide the city council or the town council leadership and all of the other things that make quality of life in rural communities a life of quality that many people had aspired to. I began to realize that that crisis was a was a natural consequence of the kind of agriculture that we had been talking about because if farms were going to get bigger and our agricultural productivity was expanding far faster than the demand for food, which only grows about 1% per year, that said that in order for some farmers to get bigger, to become more economically efficient, then other farmers had to fail. So ever so often we were going to go through a period of time when we were going to squeeze out more and more of these farmers so that other farmers could become larger. Failure was inherent in the kind of economics that I'd been taught and teaching. Failure was inherent in the kind of agriculture we were promoting. It's industrial agriculture. You know, a lot of people think of industrialization as kind of the migration from rural societies to a manufacturing society, but that's just a, a symptom or a consequence of industrialization. Industrialization is characterized by specialization, standardization, consolidation. Specialize in doing fewer things so you can do it more efficient. Once you specialize, you have to standardize those specialized operations so that they all fit together. And once you specialize, standardize, then you can simplify and routinize mechanize so that you can consolidate into larger and larger operations to achieve economies of scale. That's what it was all about. We did it first in the factories and then we did it in agriculture. That's the means by which, as we so-called at the early times said, we're going to free up farmers from the drudgery of farming so that they can go to work in the factories and offices and we discovered that we freed them up regardless of whether they want to be freed. That's what we had built a system that automatically did that. Crisis was chronic in that kind of agriculture. Whenever the production goes up, the prices go down and the farmers go out. And as a consequence of that kind of production system, whether it's in agriculture or elsewhere, the economic advantage comes from employing fewer people and making the job simpler so you can pay the people you do employ less. And so as we industrialized agriculture, we were destroying economic opportunities, not only in agriculture, but economic opportunities in rural communities as well. As I opened my eyes then to the ecological and social, I mean the economic and social consequences of that kind of agriculture, I finally began to see the ecological environmental consequences as well. You see, this industrial agriculture is inherently in conflict with the fundamental foundations of agriculture. Agriculture is an inherently a biological process. It's about living systems. Communities are too, but it's more clear in agriculture. And it's a, a biological ag kind of system that you're working with, and it doesn't fit that mechanistic approach of a, of a factory. And so we were seeing the, the negative conflict then, of, or consequences of a, of a system that was inherently in conflict with nature. And we could see it in the pollution of the air and water with the chemicals and the, and the biological, I mean the chemical waste from the pesticides and fertilizers in the large monocropping cropping systems. And we could see it in the biological waste from the large scale confinement animal feeding operations or CAFOs as we refer to them today. It was a war on nature. We had taken the technologies that come out of World War II. We took the munitions technologies. We produced cheap nitrogen fertilizer out of those same plants. We took the tank factories. We produced tractors that replaced the horses. And we took the chemical warfare and we produced pesticides. And we continued the war on nature, but nature was fighting back. And it fought back against the farmers that were being forced off of the land as the farms got larger and the number of farmers left were fewer. The whole thing really exploded in the 50s and 60s, and by the 1970s, we had lost half of the farmers that we'd had back at the peak in the 1930s. The farm crisis of the 1980s, we lost another fourth of our farmers out there, and we continue to redefine I mean, farming in such a way that we don't lose them, more of them since that time. 
But even more important, since that time, what we've done is we've basically turned agriculture over to the control of the large corporate interests because we discovered that industrial agriculture was risky during the 1980s. And so corporations come in and said, we'll take the risk, but we also take the control primarily through comprehensive contractual arrangements that are more common in livestock but are becoming more common in crops as well. And so farmers have been turned into mercenaries in this battle, this corporate war on, ag war on nature. It's the large corporations that increasingly are calling the shots, and it's the large corporations and their investors that are reaping the profits, and it's the farms and the farmers are the casualties of war, because nature continues to fight back. You know, this isn't just a bunch of meme up here preaching. There's, there's reams and reams of science and, and data out here to support everything that I'm talking about. You know, you, you can go, I'm not going to dwell on it here, but, but I like to, to go to the, kind of the big reports like the Pew Charitable Trust in 2008 did a two and a half year study where they pulled together a prestigious panel and they focused particularly on industrial livestock operations. But they looked at those operations and after two and a half year study, they came out with a report and they said, they said that the, the negative impacts of this industrial agriculture represented unaccessible unacceptable levels of risk to human health, the environment, and the well-being of the animals themselves. And they said that the negative impacts are too great and the scientific evidence is simply too strong to ignore and changes must be made and must begin now. Five years later, the Johns Hopkins School of Public Health did a follow-up survey and said, have, let's look and see if the recommended changes have been made, and they found that virtually nothing had been done. In fact, in many cases, it had gotten worse. If you want to look closer to home out here, there was a, a, the North Dakota Attorney General's Office commissioned a study in two, uh, 2004, I think it was, and, and they did, in that study, the, the, the researcher went back over 50 years a published, documented research, peer-reviewed journal research, and looked at 58 different studies of the impacts of industrial agriculture in general, crops and livestock as well, on the economic and social well-being of rural communities. And they determined in that study that the only studies that found anything positive were those that looked at the narrow economic impacts of just the jobs that were created in industrial agriculture and not the negative impacts on jobs that were lost elsewhere. And more important, they said the diminished quality of life in the rural areas. The Pew study, the 2008 study, also had a socioeconomic impact study and went back over that same kind of 50 years of research. In the case of livestock, it goes all the way back to chickens, but it goes all the way back to the California kind of industrial agriculture of the 40s and 50s. And when they found the impacts on rural communities growing inequity within the communities, increasing poverty within the communities, reduced level of activity on Main Street and the stores, fewer retail stores, less economic activity, activity and a negative impact on the, the social fabric of the rural communities. The research is there, folks. The research is there. You know, I'm, I'm not blaming the farmers that were involved in this. I was a part of it myself. For half of my life, I was supporting this. The farmers that are out here today, they're, they're, the USDA is promoting this kind of agriculture that I'm talking about, that the evidence is there. Most state departments of agriculture, by and large, are promoting it. The big agricultural universities are promoting it. I'm not blaming the farmers. We're just locked into a failed system of production. You know, that system has been documented over and over again. Anybody can find it in, in videos. I think the video documentaries are very powerful. The, uh, the uh, uh, Fast Food Nation with Eric Slaughter and, I mean, in books such as Fast Food Nature and Eric Slaughter and Omniverse Delivery with Michael Pollan, the videos, The Future of Food, uh, uh, Broken Limbs, uh, Food Incorporated, uh, Fresh the Movie, What's Organic About Organic. You know, and, and, then, and then there's other books such as the end of food, America's food, and a whole range of books and videos and various other things that are well documented out there. And they all point to the same basic thing, that a, a food system that's deceptive and everything from, uh, from, uh, you know, from flavors to advertising and is exploitive and everything from the soil on up through the workers in the, in the fast food operation. It's a food system that's lacking in ecological, social, 
and economic integrity. It quite simply is not sustainable. That's when the sustainable agriculture movement was born, with the growing realization of the things that I've documented here. It makes me, you know, really kind of sad to go back through all of that. But that's where it came from. And you're not understanding what the sustainability movement is about and what the future is about unless you understand where it came from. It emerged on the national scene in the late 80s. It had been there in the organic movement, as I said earlier in the panel. And that goes back to my story here. That was, that was when I decided that I had to do something different. Thankfully, the sustainable agriculture movement was coming along. And I could see at that point that I, even though I was a department head in my early 40s, I wasn't going to be an extension director or a dean anywhere else because you're not going to advance within an academic system when you're criticizing the dominant system that you're within. So I was looking around for somewhere to to go, I was seeing things that my colleagues were not seeing because I was looking in different places now than they were looking. And, and I found that there was a program in Washington, D.C. that was called uh, eventually the Low Input Sustainable Agriculture Program. And the person in USDA I'd been working with on the farm financial crisis, he says, USDA has just been given, what, $4 million or something. They don't have a clue in the world what to do with it. But to me, that represented an opportunity. Boy. <laughs> so I was able to get a little money out of that first uh, grants that we called the LISA program, Low Input Sustainable Agriculture. The interesting thing about that is that program emerged out of a coming together of interest. You had the organic folks, Robert Rodale and other folks that had been up there lobbying USDA for years to try to get a little money for organic research and education. And you had Kim coming together then with the, with the rural advocacy groups, such as the Center for Rural Affairs and other people that were concerned about what was happening to rural communities because of the agricultural crisis. And you had them joined with a, a relatively large group of conventional commercial agriculture people that were concerned about the rising input costs and the falling commodity prices and the fact that they were going broke out here. So you had a political coalition come together. They were able to get the money under the Agricultural Productivity Act. It was funded in 1988. The conventional agriculture or commercial co corporate agriculture sector, you heard all kinds of jokes and everything about Lisa, low input subsistence agriculture and all, all things of that nature. They ridiculed the name Lisa so much that they come around and the next time they renewed it, they call it the Sustainable Agriculture Research and Education Program because it was, at that time, organic was too controversial to be included in the title. I think that's kind of ironic. But the SARE program is still going today and it's doing great work, but it gets a pittance relative to what we're subsidizing the system that is trying to change. So the resistance is still there. Sustainability today is associated more with organic, even though organic was the unacceptable term later, for early on. And the fact was that organic becomes sufficiently popular that it become profitable, and when it's become profitable, then it became credible with the people that are driven by the profitability. But the organic movement is much, I mean the sustainability movement is much larger than the organic movement by itself. The, the sustainable farmers have all kinds of different names and no names at all. It's holistic, it's ecological farming, it's biodynamics, it's permaculture, it's practical farming, innovative farming. In the global arena, it's agroecology, it's nature farming. Uh, it's a whole range of different names, but what they have in common is that they're farming to balance the ecological, social, economic dimensions of the farming operation for long-run sustainability. At its very core value, it goes back to the core values of organics, which the early people like G.I. Rodale and Sir Albert Howard, they talked about that. It was a, 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 an ethical and moral responsibility to take care of the land, to provide a, a permanent agriculture for a permanent society. That's what, that's what it's about. And as I explained in the panel, that the, the economic, the ecological, and the social are all essential if you want to have something that's regenerative and resilient and renewing and, and, and can meet the needs of the people of the present without diminishing opportunities for the future. That's what's driving that soul system overall. That's what's driving the movement. The organic has been the most visible part of the movement because we've been able to get data and statistics on that. And as I mentioned briefly, organic food sales were growing at the rate of 20% per year throughout the decade of the 90s and up through 2008. 
doubling every three or four years during this whole period of time. It's still growing at more than 10% per year, and it's up close to $36 billion today. It mounts to a little, right at 5% now of the total, but that's the fastest growing segment it has been through that whole period of time. But as I mentioned previously, during the 1990s, they wanted to get organic into the mainstream markets, so that's when you had, had national standards come in. Up to them, we had regional certifiers that certified in different regions, but the regions were different. It didn't fit the industrial model, so we had to standardize organic. And once we did, I wrote a paper before they did it, and I said, this is what's gonna happen. You're gonna move it into the mainstream market, and fundamentally, things will change. And I'm not opposed to certified organic for the people that are really concerned about the idea of, of, of having being free of pesticides and hormones, antibiotics, GMOs, and things like that, then I think certified organic is perfectly good. But there were people that wanted to go beyond that, and that's where you saw the local food movement come in, when people wanted to buy from people they knew and they trusted, because it wasn't just about the content of the food, it was the way the animals were treated, the way the land was treated. So we saw the organic movement, I mean the local food movement, took over as the fastest growing segment of the market. And that's growing up, the last estimates are of USDA somewhere around, or it makes the industry estimates somewhere around $12 billion, but I don't think they have a clue as to how big that local market is because it's just happening everywhere. We don't have good statistics on it. They did a study in Iowa, compared it to the official statistics, and they went out and located people that were selling three or four times as much as the official statistics said. So I think we're probably up to around 10% or maybe a little less of the total market. There's something fundamentally different. And even on certified organic, we're over 10% now on vegetables and on dairy operations. So it's been fast growing. And I think what people are looking for now when they look for the local, they're still looking for that product that has ecological and social integrity. And when they find that product, they give the farmers that produce that product economic viability. We've seen the growth of it again, that we can measure that movement. It began in the farmers markets and the CSAs. The number of farmers markets have quadrupled in a 20 year period between 19, I mean, between, um, uh, to, to, let's see, 94, 90, yeah, 94 and, and 14. It, doubled, it increased from less than 1,800 to more than 8,000 in terms of farmers markets. CSAs have grown from about 100 back in 1990 to 2,700 in the last estimate that I saw. The whole idea eventually funneled into USDA, know your farmer, know your food, which is all about the local movement. They come out and help farmers build these hoop houses all over the country. You know, it, it's, it's a fast moving thing. But when we look at it, I think the future food system is being developed in these local food networks and these food hubs. I think that's what's going to replace the industrial food system is something like that. I used to call them multi-farm CSAs. They'd start off at CSAs and then the farmers decide, well, if we get together and we don't have to produce everything then, and then we can bring it in and somebody can produce meat and milk and eggs and somebody else can produce vegetables. And they call them now collaboratives or cooperatives, um, you know, and they're all across the country. That probably the one out here you're most familiar with is Idaho's Bounty. I was asking, I think they've got something like 40-some farmers or something like that now. I know there's a lot of farmers selling through that, and I was out here in the early days when they were forming that cooperative, and so they've been around for a while. You know, these things aren't easy to build. There's the Grown Locally was the first one I come across up in Decorah, Iowa. It's about the 15, 17 farmers up there that sell everything within about 10 miles of the little town of Decorah, but they provide meat, milk, and eggs, and vegetables and fruits and a whole range of things. And that's what consumers are looking for. And they can provide them with a, a variety of options. You know, you can buy CSA shares or you can have standing orders from week to week or you have an internet platform where you can go on and the farmers put on week to week what they have over and above what's already committed and the customers go on and see what's available and then they order week to week and you can add that to the CSA share, the standing order or whatever. And so this provides a wide variety of product. You can connect with a large number of customers in your particular area. And I think that's where we're going. The Viroqua Co-op in Viroqua, Wisconsin has like 180 farmers uh, similar in size to Good Natured Family Farms out of Kansas City that sells into the hen house markets but also has a big CSA that goes into a hospital there. Oklahoma Food Cooperative and there's other state cooperatives where they brought out, go out and, and connect with a larger number of farmers. Um, the USDA went together with some others, um, I think it's the Good Food Network, and they've identified over 300, 
of what they call food hubs that are around the country. I can't vouch for the others, but the one I've mentioned fit the characteristics that I talk about. I, th I think the future of the food system, the future food system is going to be, is, is going to be community-based networks of small, sustainable food systems that are locally based where people have some sort of, a, of a, a sense of connectedness with each other. I think that's the, that's the important part of that. It, it, the important thing about local is, is not that it just comes from a piece of ground or whatever, but, it, but it's it, that you feel a responsibility as a producer for your customer, and as a customer you feel some sense of responsibility for the farmer. There's some sort of a, a mutual commitment to the greater good of each other and to the community as a whole. And there's a limit to how big something like that can get. You, you know, Wendell Berry says that uh, farm sustainably, you know, you have to know your land, you have to be able to um, uh, care for your land, you have to be, and the farm has to be small enough that you can know it and small enough that you can care for it. And I would argue that to have a sustainable food network, it has to be small enough that, you know, that you can know the people. And the fact of the matter is that you can only truly love just so much land and so many people. And once it gets to be so big and so many, that you no longer have that sense of concern and mutual commitment, then you're stretching it to the point where it's no longer sustainable. The opportunities are there. They're there today. The most credible of the big respected surveys, such as the Hartman Report and others, indicate that there's roughly a third of the consumers that are looking for something fundamentally different than they're finding in the supermarkets and the franchise restaurants today, and they are willing to pay premium prices to get what they want. They're looking for food that has ecological, social integrity, and they will provide the economic integrity. The market is already three times as big, at least, as we're able to serve. The challenge is connecting people that want that food and will pay for it with farmers who will be willing to produce it and connect with those consumers. That's all it's waiting for today. Now, I agree, you know, today we need to move as much product as we can, you know, through the conventional markets with the retail stores and the restaurants and things of this nature. But if we have a third of the people out there that are willing to help create something fundamentally new, something fundamentally better, then if we can create that model for the future, then the rest of the people will move and we can change the system as a whole. Thank you. So do I believe that that future is possible? I get asked that, and my answer is yes. I believe it's possible. If something is possible, then there's hope. Now, I'm not so naive as to believe that it's easy. I'm not so naive or uninformed to know that there are powerful economic and political forces in the way of bringing that about. But I know that it's possible because I'm able to go to conferences like this all across the country and I see people out here that are doing these things and this movement is growing. This movement is alive. This movement will not be stopped. There's a growing concerns on the part of the consumer. There was a recent report in, in Fortune magazine that talked about the war on big food and how the big food retailers and manufacturers are concerned. They lost $4 billion in market share last year to consumers that wanted natural, organic, hormone, antibiotic-free, GMO-free, grass-based, free range, a whole range of things. And they are scrambling about how they can provide that through the industrial system. But folks, I can tell you, you can't push sustainable agriculture, sustainable food through that system without compromising the integrity of it. You have an advantage as a producer making a direct connection with a customer that they cannot replicate. They cannot develop a personal relationship with your customers, and you can. They not, cannot develop a sense of mutual commitment between you and your customers. They can't do that, and you can. So they're concerned about that. There's a massive public relations campaign all across the country that's sponsored by the large agribusiness corporations and what I call the agricultural establishment spending over $25 million a year with large national PR firms, some of the best in the country. And if you go to the websites, you'll find they're trying to restore the faith and confidence 
of the American public in industrial agriculture. They're concerned, they're worried. That's reason for hope. You know, what's happening out here, you can, you can look at this, you know, I've gone through this on my website and I've kind of developed out scenarios, one scenario going out to 2040. And you know, you could ask, you know, why do you believe that this is possible? And so let me give you some reasons in finishing up here. The first is, I'm an old man. And I've seen this whole industrial food system developed primarily in my adult lifetime, but certainly in my lifetime. When I was a kid growing up down in South Missouri, I would bet that 90% of our food came within 50 miles of my home. Back in those days, we didn't have supermarkets. I can remember the first supermarket that come into our part of the country. I think I was at least late grade school, maybe in high school when it came in. It was a Piggly Wiggly store. And up to that time, we would take our grocery list to the grocery store. We would give it to someone behind the counter. They would go back and pull off what was on the list, you know, two cans of beans, slice off a pound of bacon, you know, get a five pounds of potatoes or whatever was on the list, various cans of stuff, and they would put it in a brown paper bag, a poke, we called them, put it in a poke and total up the bill and we'd pay for it. That's the way you got your groceries. You know, I, so we didn't have supermarkets. We didn't have franchise restaurants. First franchise restaurant I saw was when I went to college. All those are in our lifetime. Basically, that whole system has been built within a 50-year period back here. That whole system was put together. We went from a sustainable local, basically, to an industrial global in a period of 50 years. And it's going to continue to change. It'll be just as different 50 years from now as it was, as it was then. So I've seen the time. I've seen it different. And, and I think... I believe today that the sustainable food movement is farther along than the industrial food movement when I was a kid. You see, back then, we didn't, have, we didn't even have tractors. The only tractor I saw was an old steel wheel tractor that I don't know if they ever started it up. I remember they turned out grade school whenever the, the old steam-driven threshing machine would come by. Everything was done by horses, but you had to have a steam engine to pull the, th the pulley on the threshing machine and all that come by. The sustainable agriculture movement's much farther along than it is today. And the big difference is, my number two reason is, is the agricultural system at that time was working much better than our agricultural system is today. There's a growing realization that there's something fundamentally wrong, you know, not just with the ecological and social dimensions that I've talked about, but as you saw earlier today, this, this industrial food system has failed in its most fundamental purpose. It's failed to provide domestic food security for the people of this country. You see, while I was working back in industrial agriculture, my belief was I was really working for the good of society because we were gonna make good, safe, wholesome food affordable for everyone. We did not do it. We've got a higher percentage of people that are hungry or insecure in this country today than we had in the 1960s when the last phase of this started. As you saw this afternoon, about 15% of the people are classified as food insecure. Back in the 60s when the uh, CBS did the Hunger in America TV show, about 5% of the people were classified as food insecure. Food insecurity has tripled during this period of time percentage-wise. Over 20% of our children live in food insecure homes in the wealthiest country in the world. So that you can't erase hunger by trying to make food cheap. And in the process of making cheap food, not only did we fail to feed the hungry people, but the people that can afford to eat were making them sick. And you saw a little bit of hint on that, and we need to have a lot more talk about it. You know, particularly in the lower income communities, we've got an, an epidemic of diet-related disease, obesity, diabetes, heart disease, high blood pressure, a whole range of cancer associated with the American food system. While we were cutting back on the, on the amount of money that we spent on food, our percentage in half, we doubled, more than doubled, the amount that we were spending on health care. We didn't feed the hungry, and the feed that we're producing is not meeting the needs of the people. There's every reason to change, and there's growing public awareness of this that's going to change. Number three is the technology. We've got new technologies today. You know, we talk about industrial technologies, but there's a different kind of technology that's coming along that we can use for a different reason. You can see it in the microcomputers and the, you know, the, the tablets and the smartphones and all of those sorts of things. Those are small-scale technologies. They've given us a lot more independence. They've given us a lot more freedom to kind of break away from that industrial food system out there today. 
Those same kind of technologies are just as applicable in agriculture when we start looking in different places for reality and start looking in different places for solutions rather than being ever blinders on into the industrial technologies as we look to the future. You can see the technologies already on the cheap, portable electric fences that have made rotation grazing possible on all kinds of, and other kinds of grass-based livestock system that would not have been possible back in the old days with electric fences that I grew up with. We see different kinds of walk-behind, pool-behind, small-scale technologies that can take the drudgery out of organic, sustainable agriculture but leave the thinking and creativity in it. That's what we need to be looking for. And you see a lot of those technologies are being developed in Europe and other places where they're further along in this whole process than we are. And as the increase, the popularity of those technologies increase, then the, the cost will go down and you'll have more people that are creating more things because they can market them. I think the, the possibilities are out there. And even more important, it's the digital technologies, such as the microcomputers, and I talked about the local food networks where you have the, the internet platform. You've heard about internet marketing here. That's where more people are going. I think that's where we're going in the future because you know, these technologies allow you to kind of isolate yourself locally, but they also allow you to stay connected so, uh, locally or socially. Yeah, I bet you people here that are marketing on the internet to places and other, other people in other parts of the country, you have connections with those people. They know who you are and you know who they are and you can connect with them over the space, but we don't have to do it all across the country. We can do it within our own communities. We can use these technologies to connect a lot more farmers with a lot more customers and we can get together at farmers markets and local festivals and still have CSAs and various other things where you see your farmer, you see your customers now and then, even if they're over a big space. If you get together and make face-to-face -face contact so they can look at you and say, do I trust that person or don't I trust that person? Do I care about that person or don't I care about that? You develop that personal connectedness and then you can maintain that connectedness over the internet and various other ways in between. And you can use those platforms then to develop this whole system. And I think eventually you talk about the convenience of it, we'll have a more convenient system. I don't think it'll ever be as cheap. We don't want cheap food. We tried that and it didn't work. But it can be more convenient. There's no reason that we can't have our food brought right to our door, our local food brought right to our door. Go on the internet week by week and we have some standing orders or CSAs or whatever it is. We add to that. This food is collected in one place. There's somebody, either FedEx, UPS, or whatever in the beginning comes by and picks it up. They're going through the communities anyway. All they need is a little refrigerator in the back and you have a refrigerated box by the door or whatever. You get a food delivery. You know, who knows? Maybe the, the new function of the U.S. Postal Service will be the food carrier rather than the mail carrier, you know? So we have rule free delivery for food to everybody. How much more convenient can you get? And you know the farmers that you're getting it from. You say, that's way out, huh? Well, do you know that just recently, the value of, total value of Amazon stock surpassed that of Walmart? Walmart, the internet marketing company, is now worth more than Walmart. Now, Walmart still sells a lot more product, but that tells you where the investors see the future of retailing is. That's where it's headed. We have opportunities out there. We can connect personally, you know, with the festivals and that sort of thing, but we can have the transactions electronically. Big change. I think the change is coming in retail, and I don't see any reason that local food should not be a part of that. You know, this isn't about self-sufficiency, I argue, for communities. It's, it's about security, but the security is, is more about the connectedness of people and people connected who care about each other, who can take care of each other when times get hard. It's not about providing everything. I think we'll still have coffee and bananas and a whole bunch of stuff that will come in from somewhere else. But even when they come from another country, it can be from someone you've got a connection with, someone you know personally, or someone you know that you know personally in another country. We can personalize this whole system. The whole thing that has to hold these local networks together are shared values. It's those personal connections, the personal commitment to something that's fundamentally different. And that's what it takes to hold them together. You, you, you can see the importance of shared values in communities like the Amish community. Now, how much, more, how much more hostile can an environment get to the values that the Amish hold dear? 
Now, you and I might not share those same values, but if we have shared values, we can find a way to make the things work economically. We can do that. But without those shared values, then the whole thing will fall apart. If we have a shared values and a shared commitment to creating a food system that has ecological, social, economic integrity that meets the needs of everyone in our community in the, in the present without diminishing opportunities for the future, that I'm absolutely positive that we can do it, that it is possible. My final reason for being hopeful for the future, for knowing that it's possible, is that there's an awakening among people I sense awakening upon people all across the country. You can read it, you can hear it, you can see it in many different places. There is an awakening among people that we need the kind of relationships with each other and the relationship with the earth that it takes to build a sustainable agriculture and a sustainable food system. You see, we are material beings. We need food, clothing, shelter. We need the things that we can buy in the economy. But we're also social beings. We need relationships with other people that are personal, that has nothing to do with what we're going to get in terms of economic value in return. We're just simply created that way. We really need to care for each other and to be cared for. We need to love and we need to be loved for reasons that have nothing to do with economic self-interest. And we're also ethical and moral beings. We need a sense of purpose in our life. We need a sense of rightness and goodness. We, we, we need a relationship with the earth. We, we need a sense that we're fulfilling our responsibility as caretakers of the earth for the benefit of future generations because it's important to us. As the Pope said, our very dignity is at stake in caring for the earth. Our very dignity, our sense of self-worth, our sense of being, our sense of purpose. We need those social and ethical values that are essential for a sustainable food system because it's in our enlightened, wise self-interest as well. When we open our minds and see things differently, We'll see that food is not just fuel for the body to be acquired as cheaply as we can get it, but it also feeds the soul. It feeds the spirit. And in a spiritual awakening such as this, there is always hope. Thank you. You want to take some questions, or I, I'm, I left some time for somebody else's truth. I know not everybody here uh, agrees with me unless they've already left, uh, <laughs> and that's perfectly okay because I meant what I said. You know, I just I speak my truth as I see it. I, I don't intend to offend anyone, but I feel a responsibility to say what I feel, and I hope that you will take the same responsibility to say what you feel. And if you want to do it, then now's the time to do it. And if you don't, then that's okay, too, and we'll go drink beer together, okay? <laughs> mic check, mic check, mic check. Hi, guys. Uh, so my name is Jesse, and I have the honor of working with Idaho's Bounty. I do the wholesale delivery uh, here in the Treasure Valley, uh, delivering lots of the good food that we've been talking about. Uh, one of the greatest disconnects that I see, um, in my opinion, is that you have this huge movement of people that want, they want that local, sustainable, organic, they want that good food. You have restauranteurs that are paying high premiums for that food. But there's 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 a there's a lack in the in the story, and so it's just the we get the the one or two words we have like local, you know, and you'll just go to a restaurant and they'll have maybe at the most the couple of the farms uh, on their menu, you know, so that right. people see that. Right. But there's a there's a people do not understand what local means. Um, they don't understand that the restauranteur uh, or the chef, when they're when they're buying a case of eggs, they're paying twice as much for that local sustainable case of eggs. 
And um, so my question is, have you seen any models where people are doing that well? And how can we, as a sort of a disconnected group that, that don't have you know, the PR de you know, department and the millions of dollars to put into advertising, how can we communicate that, that history that uh, that care, the husbandry, and um, that the value, um, the added value. We um, uh, somebody was talking about that earlier, um, and communicate that to people. So because they they want that, they crave that, they want that story behind right. what they're eating. And if you've seen that, or how can we as right. a group communicate that? Yeah. Yeah, I, I think the, the thing is, is that uh, it, it's, everybody wants local, you know. Walmart wants local. They want to put up the pictures. Uh, Whole Food wants local. The restaurants want a few items on the menu that are local. And, and all of that's good to a certain extent, but it's not the integrity you're talking about. I think the key is to find a restaurateur that's really committed to this, is developing. The, this is going to be the image of their restaurant. It's, it's really going to have integrity. And then you have to be committed to providing that restaurant with things or communicating with them, not just providing them, but negotiating with them. And most of the people I've talked about that have been successful, the restaurateur kind of negotiates with the farmer at the beginning of the season, what they're going to take and when they want to take it. Some of them even plan their menu around what the farmer is growing. And some of them go to having their own farm if they can't find farmers that do that. But I mean, they're committed to that personally and they reflect it in the way they do business. Well, you got to have farmers working with them that are just as committed to that restaurant tour in helping that succeed. And then I think the word of mouth spreads out much more than, than the advertising and things of that nature. I think just this whole movement's going to be built mainly on kind of personal connectedness. Not necessarily everything has to be personal, uh, you know, you deliver it to your customer, but there has to be this sense of personal connectedness and mutual commitment to making it work. And too often, I think we, we say, well, we have to have their own market. I think Colette talked about earlier, you know, there's only, uh, I don't remember what you said, there's 15, 20% or 30% of the people that are truly committed. I would say, you know, the national statistics show that about a third of the people are truly committed. That says about two thirds are out here and people say, well, how do we get to two thirds? And I say, the two thirds are not your customers right now. It's, it's this small group. If it's 15%, that's way more than you're supplying. So I say focus on the people who share your values, are willing to support it, and make your operation economically viable when you make it ecologically and socially responsible. And, and you get those people together and they create a relationship that other people can look at and say, this is fundamentally better. That's one reason that restaurants want to get on board with local food, is they see people like, you know, Alice Waters out in California and various other places you can name, Dan Barber in New York and Stone Barn. They become kind of the icons of what it really means to be a first-class restaurateur. And they want to be like that. That wasn't advertising. That wasn't promotion. That was somebody doing this thing that worked. And most of us cannot afford to eat in the upscale restaurants you know, where a lot of this stuff starts, but that's the way trends often start. It's the upscale restaurants and even people like Whole Foods when they started up, they create kind of the, the epitome of what it means to really be out on the forefront, to, to be successful, to be doing something that everybody else wants to do. And then when it filters down to where your small scale restaurants like in Fairfield, Iowa and other places, you know, the, just the local restaurants, they want to buy from local farmers. I'm going to be speaking next week at a local food uh, annual conference in Fairfield, Iowa, where the local restaurant tours that are just normally priced places want to get more and more of their stuff locally. So I think it's the personal connectedness that makes it fit, the personal commitment. Anybody else? I'll keep the questions as answers short because we got a couple of three here. You want to go first down here? Well, uh, I'd like, first of all, I'd like to congratulate you on your very passionate uh, appeal here. And uh, I'm of the same age or maybe even a little older. And I've been through what you talked about and I've been part of industrialized agriculture. Anybody that's been around for very long, has seen it go through. And I'm really intrigued in, with the changes that we as farmers are making in trying to go back to Mother Nature's way of doing things. And Mother Nature's way seems to be, the very centerpiece of it is the survival of the fittest. 
And it doesn't matter whether you're plants or animals or fish or whatever. Right. And uh, so what I'm intrigued about is that, yes, there will be a place for what you're advocating. Right. But where will it come into, there will be competition as it goes along. Yeah. And it will be the survival of the fittest of your ideas and the existing ones. And I've been following the life of the co-op system. Right. It used to be that the co-op was the centerpiece of the town. Right. And it has shrunk and shrunk and shrunk and now the little co-ops are being sold out to the big co-ops and the, that level is being sold out now to a huge co-op, CHS, right. which is a world, it competes with Cargill and Bungie and all the rest of those people. Right. And so as I listen to all of this, I wonder how many people are are going to get it really involved, and where will it end up? And I don't yeah. suppose I'll be around to see all of that. Well, there's about a dozen questions in there, but on the, on the matter of the co-ops, when they, when they got too big, they lost the personal connection. This and they returned into corporations, basically, is what they've done. They pay their taxes with a different forum, that's all. They're not really co-ops. The balance is between cooperative and, and competition, and it's not really survival of the fittest in the sense that we talk about it now within nature, because the, the species that gains a position of dominance in its natural ecosystem and its population explodes, it uses up its resources, it kills itself off, it dies off with disease. So that's the fittest, if you want to call it the way we interpret it today. Survival is those that cooperate, those that expand, but expand in harmony with those things around them. They balance cooperation with competition. They compete for food, but they do it in a way that fits the overall environment in which they flourish, and that's the only way you can sustain any species. And those are the species that are still with us today. So that's what I'm looking for, is the balance of the competitiveness that it takes to do a good job and serve your customers well, but the cooperation that it takes to maintain the integrity of the system. So I'd just like to express my gratitude. We've got quite a diverse group of people here today and a lot of really knowledgeable folks. And I'm really grateful for the opportunity I've had to talk with some of you and, and ask questions. Um, I've had more intelligent conversations with the case weights on a tractor than I have some old farmers. And, you know, I'm really grateful for everybody here today. So my question is, it seems to me an underlying theme has been outreach and education. So how could we incorporate agritourism into the local movement. Yeah, I, I think the best way is for it to become a part of the, the local food movement, really, as opposed to kind of a separate thing where you just do it for entertainment. I think the best way is to have an operation where you can invite people to come out. I just came from a meeting in, uh, in Wisconsin, uh, Monroe, Wisconsin, just south of Madison, and we stayed, those of us that were on the program stayed on a CSA farm, and uh, she had a big CSA, and a uh, big CSA, I, there's nothing and it's more hard, harder work intellectually or physically than running a big CSA. So what she decided to do is cut back on her CSA, but now she has three or four dinners on the farm a, a year with her old CSA customers, and she comes out, they come out, and she prepares the meal with all the local food, and she says she makes more money now with a small CSA, and her customers come out and just love coming out the farm and being there with the chickens and hogs and everything else, so she's kind of combining. That's just one example of what I'm talking about. But I think in all these things, we need to integrate them together. If you just turn the, the farm into a Disneyland, I don't think that's sustainable, you know. But take a farm that's really a good place to have a family and raise a family to be around and to live on, and then invite your customers out and create events if that's you're inclined to do that, and ask them to contribute for the entertainment as well as for the food. Make it all part of the same whole. We had one more up here, and then, didn't we? And then I, I don't want to leave somebody that might want to disagree with me out. I go to conferences where lots of people disagree with me. I had anybody throw anything at me lately, but it probably felt like it. Hi, I'm Kelsey, and I'm going to disappoint you by not disagreeing with you. Um, I really honor your truth. Thank you for sharing it. And one of the questions I want to ask is to pull apart the um, legal barriers to sustainability that you indicate. You know, you say there are huge economic, um, powerful political forces that don't necessarily want to see the right. industrial agricultural model change. Right. So, you know, we're t talking about relationships and creating something that we want right. to see and nurturing our own economy here. So what do we do when we do come up against those legal challenges and, and yeah. um, you know, from a technical legal standpoint and just from a 
yeah. people I, relationship. I, I think you, you know, you, you stand up for, for your truth. You stand up and say, look, I know what the conventional wisdom is about all these things, but this is what I see and this is what I read. And I didn't mention it, but I'm glad you brought it in here. I think what we're talking about is a part of recreating democracy as well as recreating the food system. And one of the things I didn't mention is, is I think eventually, somewhere along the line, when the change really comes about, is when we change uh, farm policy, when we change food policies, and there's people seriously talking about that. If we were to remove all of the government subsidies for industrial agriculture, including picking up the cost of their risk with huge payments for crop insurance, and when we have a, a poultry flu or swine flu or whatever, you know, we paid, uh, ended up paying about $14 a bird for these, these chickens that were lost in these big CAFOs out in Iowa out here. When we quit subsidizing this system that no longer is serving its intended purpose, then you're going to see sustainable agriculture and local foods and organic be much more competitive with what's out there. The thing that keeps them propped up. So we, got to, we have to confront power with, with truth. We have to confront power with the power of the people. We have the ultimate power to change these things. But you've got to be willing to stand up and say it. I get criticized all the time. You know, people say I'm too radical, I'm too outspoken, I'll make people mad. Well, I'm just sorry. You know, I'm just too old and don't have enough time left to really be tactful about a lot of these things. And so I have to say what's on my heart. That's all I know how to do. Did you have a... Okay. We're probably over time. Everybody's ready for beer. Thank you very much for your attention and for your kindness. I wish you all the very best. <laughs>